Members, we are considering address in reply. And this is the Honourable Member's inaugural speech. Please provide her with your undivided attention. I give the call to the Honourable Sophia Momond. Thank you, President, and congratulations on your appointment. Congratulations to all of you on your appointment. Uh, I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and their cultures and to Elders past, present and emerging. May we learn to connect to spirit as you all seem to do so naturally. My initial reaction to being elected was one of surprise and shock, and I think they came out very well in the media. Uh, after becoming used to the idea, though, I found myself changing and evolving into this new role that I've been given here. I suspect some of you may have experienced something similar. I certainly know my colleague here has. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be here. It's um, not something that I ever thought would happen in my life. I'm aware of the amazing opportunity, the extraordinary honour, the privilege that has been provided me, and I am very much humbled by this. I'm also humbled by being part of this group of people here um, with such obvious diversity, different nationalities, different access, uh, accents, different skill sets um, that people are bringing with them, and the amazing number of strong women that are present here as well. I feel that the diversity here is an indicator of how we have grown as a society. And every time a woman achieves a place of influence, it inspires, motivates, and normalizes our presence, making it that little bit easier for another woman to rise up. Um, though my first is not quite the same, of the same magnitude as Edith Cowan's appointment here, uh, as the 114th woman to be appointed, I do have an interesting first that will ensure my inclusion in the history books. I'm the first person, and thus the first woman, uh, to have been voted in on a legalised cannabis platform alone. Something that my mum and I think is, is very, very funny. Uh, she couldn't be here and she will be watching and she will be very, very proud. Okay, so um, cannabis regulation trends are very much followed globally by campaigners and other interested parties. Consequently, I'm not just slightly famous here and I'm being recognised out there already as that cannabis lady. I've also gained some notoriety on an international level. The experience of being plugged from anonymous mediocrity and rise to a type of international internet famous has been fascinating, to say the least. I've had people from around the world contact me, uh, Spain, the US, um, the Netherlands as well, and they are all tracking what's going on here. I would like to share with you today some of my journey that brought me here. What you may notice is that, like several others mem other members here, I have, a, I have an accent. It might be hard to place. There's reasons for that. So I was born in the Netherlands to very adventurous uh, parents. As a result of this, we moved to South Africa when I was four years of age. Um, this was in 1972, and that was the first time that I learned to speak English. Um, we arrived there via a ship, a ship named the Orense. And if you are very familiar with political history, you might know that this is also the ship that brought Tony Abbott to Australia. Um, as an aside, <laughs> I don't iron ever. Okay. At the time that we moved to South Africa, there was great uh, unrest. Nelson Mandela was imprisoned uh, on Robben Island. Apartheid was a very normal part of life. Everything was segregated. Um, I went to a white people school, and I remember my first day there, it was quite scary. We had a massive headmaster who threatened us with a belt if we were naughty. Um, but he also uh, scared us 
by saying that if black people were to attack, we would have to hide in the gym, and if they were to throw bombs at us, we had to hide under our desks. Um, all of that, the unfairness and the fear, made a huge impression on this little girl here. And this has stuck with me. Um, and I will always try to elevate the voices of Indigenous people wherever I go and whenever I have that opportunity. And we lived there for four years. Uh, my, sis my little sister was born there, but at that stage it became too dangerous to stay and so we went back to the Netherlands. It only took about two weeks for my parents to realise that the Netherlands are cold, uh, it's small and very, very crowded. So they started looking at a different place to settle their young family. And in 1983, in January, we arrived here by plane on a very lovely balmy night. Uh, after moving a few times, we ended up living in Heathridge and I started my studies at Ocean Reef Senior High School. As a teenager, though I was used to moving around, this was quite a difficult time. This is also where I had my first exposure to cannabis. Um, kids were selling cannabis in the locker area and use was widespread. I firmly believe that um, because cannabis was, is unregulated uh, and illegal, it led to very little safeguarding of the children there. It was around this time too that I acquired my first boyfriend. Uh, he had some anger issues and in hindsight was very good at coercive control, something that I didn't have the maturity to understand nor the words to describe. When I tried to leave him, he threatened to drive his car into my parents' lounge room. Um, this was happening during and after my graduation of high school. It was a very stressful time and I was very frightened. This led to my parents and myself deciding that me leaving the country to study nursing in the Netherlands was a good idea. To this day, I've tried to maintain a very low profile and I check his whereabouts via social media regularly. So this started 35 years ago and this experience of male violence has now influenced me for most of my life. Anyway, I went to the Netherlands um, I ended up studying nursing there at the Amsterdam Medical Centre, a 900-bed university hospital. It was the first hospital in the world with a dedicated AIDS ward, and there was still much anxiety around the pathways of infection. The strict hygiene practices that were implemented at that stage were considered gold standard, uh, and I still have some of those habits today for which I have been ridiculed in the past, and now all of a sudden people are agreeing me, with me. It was here that I became aware of the medicinal actions of cannabis, uh, where some of the more experienced nurses would subtly hint for chemo patients to get their friends or family to bring a joint and go outside to smoke it. Those who did would come back happier, with less pain, no nausea, and an appetite. There was no pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drug available that offered the same benefits and reduced suffering effectively and without side effects. And this was 30 years ago already. I think of all the suffering that this herb could have reduced in the meantime and how unfair it has been to those people who did not have access to it to suffer through the nausea and discomfort of chemotherapy. Uh, what was interesting about my time too in the hospital there is that my, um, I was 19, I was a young Dutch nurse with an international patient base who spoke very good English with a South African and Australian accent. And this confused quite a few people while I was there. Very handy though. Uh, I loved my independence there. I made many friends there and I still have contact with them. Uh, as a contrast, what was interesting to note was that even though cannabis was legal and easily ac uh, accessible there, none of my friends used, and the exposure I had in Australia was actually far greater than what I experienced in the Netherlands. 
Binge drinking wasn't an issue there either, even though alcohol was, uh, could be bought at supermarkets. I suspect that the act of legalisation um, made the act of drinking and smoking so much less re rebellious and exciting. I graduated in 1991 and moved back to Australia to be with my parents soon after. But during my studies as a nurse, uh, possibly due to the nature of the job, the eczema that I had suffered from as a child had been severely aggravated. To such a degree, I was unwell and unable to work. In trying to improve my health, I first came across naturopathy, found it very interesting, and decided to go back to study. Whilst I was there, a traditional Chinese medicine course was also started, um, and I finally ended up graduating in 2003. I suspect I'm one of the very few people on this planet who has qualifications in three types of medicine, so Western, Western Alternative, and Eastern, and it certainly allowed for some interesting insights into health and well-being. Unfortunately, after graduating, my health did go further downhill. I ended up with severe fatigue and was bed-bound due to this. As my life continued, I tried to keep going as much as possible uh, to work in my field. My driver, my motivation in life has always been about helping people, helping animals, um, and saving the planet. So even as a 12-year-old girl, I was signing petitions to save the whales. I think it's unfortunate that 40 years later, we are still signing petitions to save the whales. Um, working did become untenable at some stage, and I came to the realization that my dream of making the world a better place was not going to happen. I simply did not have the physical resources uh, that one needed to do so. This led to some uh, quite severe depression on top of the fatigue and some of the other ex uh, symptoms that I was experiencing. Um, at that stage, I didn't really want to die, but I also didn't see the value of living quite so much anymore. I lost my, curios cur Ooh, I lost my curiosity and my joie de vivre. The things that gave me personal satisfaction, that gave my life meaning, were unachievable. I realized I needed to change my parameters of what living a good life meant of what living a satisfying life would mean to me. So this led, led me to coming up with three guidelines to engage myself with life again. And these aren't in any particular order. So learn something new every day. And it might be the most random little factoid, it doesn't matter. Eat something new every day. Um, doesn't matter, new recipe, new food, because you may find your new favorite food right there, and what a shame it will be to miss out on that. Uh, third rule, help someone or something every day. So I started to live that way, and I found that this is expressed in some interesting ways. For instance, giving someone acupressure when you notice that they have a headache, helping with a massage in the shoulders, um, picking up plastic when I'm out walking my dog so it is removed from the environment watering a wilted plant. So even though I couldn't change the world, I was able to make the world of difference to those I helped. Um, and that really greatly engaged me in life again and gave me personal satisfaction. I did end up coming up, uh, finding a fourth rule, and that was to never be rigid about the first three rules. The, ultra, the ultimate result was that I changed my thinking my brain became attuned, looking for opportunities. I slowly became more engaged in life. And even though I was still very unwell, um, and I've only recently been able to get some decent diagnoses for that, which is quite a shame, uh, with symptoms that include chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, possibly Lyme's disease, Meniere's disease, which is why I'm deaf, just so you know, uh, Bartonella infection and multiple food intolerances. It took 30 years to get a diagnosis. I have seen many doctors. I've also obviously tried to treat myself. And mostly as a woman, I was um, fobbed off with another antidepressant and told to just not stress so much. Um, 
I felt that that was very much the new woke version of diagnosing women with hysteria versus actually taking notice of our symptoms. And I'm sure other women here can relate to that. Okay, now I realise that some of that story may come across as sad. It is by no means so. My journey has given me compassion, insight, wisdom, and a zest for life that is turning out to be contagious and inspiring to others. And it is because of that that I am here. I'm grabbing life by the ovaries, and I'm living my best life ever right now. Uh, because of the understanding that I gained, my interests are broad. I realize I'm here on a legalized cannabis platform, but I would love to see improved mental health care. Housing and homelessness need to be addressed. My demographic, women in their 50s, are currently the most at risk of becoming homeless. We are largely invisible. Um, a lot of the, the women that are homeless uh, have bought a tiny home, have bought a motor home, and are couch surfing. So they're very clever at coping, but they're somewhere in between needing social housing um, and certainly not being able to afford to buy their own place. Um, other things that I'm passionate about, domestic violence, uh, I would love to see equity for women and girls, very specifically uh, indigenous women and girls. Uh, I love the idea and the science of regenerative agriculture, improving the environment, economic empowerment of uh, indigenous people and women, and accessible education for all. So, um, as I've told you, some of my experiences have come about simply uh, from being born a woman in this world or a female in this world. And systemic and institutional sexism and racism, racism are still very much evident. In closing, I would like to share an insight gained through the work of Charles Darwin. For many years, people have somewhat uh, misinterpreted one of his insights in relation to evolutionary biology. Um, the interpretation that we ended up with was certainly a culturally influenced interpretation. He spoke about survival and adaptation. It was interpreted as survival of the fittest, the strongest, the alphas. It turns out there's only one thing one quality that's the more important than the rest that ensures the survival of a species, and that is cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you and congratulations, Honourable Member, and I wish you all the very best for your time in this place. Decision. <laughs> <laughs>